the reason we chose the two buildings we did for these epi- for this episode was not only because they were conveniently the places where ceremonies occurred, but because these ceremonies were seen as the making and unmaking of queens, especially somebody like Anne Boleyn, who underwent these very different ceremonies. And in the case of the Tower of London, the same building held very different significance for her. What she had once thought as the scene of her greatest triumph ultimately became the place of her downfall. I'm Kate. I'm Callie. We're two friends who met in an early modern history MA. Welcome to the Six Queens podcast, where queenship reigns supreme. For the second episode in our Spaces series, we thought we would look at some of the ceremonial spaces that would have been known to our Tudor queens. Specifically, we're going to be looking at religious ceremonial space. And then in part two, we're going to be looking at the site of executions, the two executions of Anne Boleyn and Catherine Howard, respectively, just to show you a little bit about the sort of public life of the queen and the spaces that she would have known in her public role as the queen, both good and bad. I think the exciting thing about these two spaces is that they were kind of a come full circle. Um, So if we're looking at the Tower of London and then at Westminster Abbey, so where they'll go to start, uh, where our queens will go to start their journey and their life as a queen, hoping it will blossom into that happily ever after, which it never does. And then coming full circle and then joining us back at the tower. The place where a lot of the queens started their their journey, yes, as, as a queen, was at Westminster Abbey because this was the place of coronations. It's a bit of a wrinkle because only two of Henry's wives actually received a coronation, Catherine of Aragon and Anne Boleyn. So we're going to be looking a bit at their different ceremonies, but we're mostly going to be looking at Westminster Abbey itself, but and also its um, religious significance as a place where the queen would go to carry out the holier religious side of her persona, as opposed to the court, which is a more secular political space. And then what we'll be doing, in, as Kate mentioned, in the second half of the, today's episode is we're going to be having a look at the Tower of London um, and we're going to be having a look again, more of that public private sort of relationship that um, happened between the exit uh, that took place at the execution. So what we'll be do- doing is looking at the execution of Anne Boleyn and of Catherine Howard. So I think one of the really good things about the way we structure these episodes and the way we have our conversations is that we're able to probably dig in a little bit deeper and really let spaces shine for themselves as kind of a, a, a feature and a and a player in the stories of our queens. Whereas if we'd taken a look at them in that chronological order, I think we tend to miss out that physical space. So I'm going to kick things off with Westminster Abbey and coronations. So a little bit of just narrative work to begin with, just so we're uh, all on the same page. Westminster Abbey is in London. It is a royal church and it is very historically significant because it's the site of royal coronations as well as several royal tombs. So it's a it's a cathedral space that's very much associated with the English British monarchy and we see this in the Tudor period as well. The ceremony that we're going to be focusing on in Westminster Abbey is the coronation, specifically queenly coronations. And uh, there are quite a lot of rules to this. So I just want to define some terms and uh, explain to you what the different ceremonies entailed. So the first one we're going to be looking at is the 1509 coronation of Henry VIII and his wife, Catherine of Aragon. 
which happened jointly. It was technically Henry VIII's coronation. It was when he was crowned king, but he was already married to Catherine at the time. So in the same ceremony, she was also crowned as his queen. So she was one of the two who received a coronation simply because she was just married to Henry at the time. But a queen can also, a queen consort, that is, can also receive her own coronation in her own right. And this is what happened to Anne Boleyn in 1533. She had just technically married Henry. She was very pregnant with Elizabeth at the time. And Henry was trying to drive home the point that this was his life now and this was the queen. So they orchestrated this massive coronation for her. And uh, actually, it's the last coronation of its kind. There hasn't been another queen consort in English history to have a single coronation since Anne Boleyn's. They have always been crowned with their husbands. So this stands out as a really big event, uh, which is what Henry wanted. He wanted everybody to see Anne on parade. So I think the interesting thing about Anne's coronation um, as opposed to Catherine of Aragon's like you were saying it, it, it is a singular event it's not the joint coronation of both Henry and Catherine um, and I think it was really important for this to be a success for Henry and for Anne because public opinion was not necessarily always on her side and there was a little bit of a atmosphere surrounding um, her becoming queen and her marriage to Henry so I think it really rather depends on who you speak with about the success, um, especially of Anne's coronation procession through London into Westminster. Because if you were to speak with people like Eustace Chapuis, um, who was a diplomat to Charles V, serving in the court of Henry VIII, for his, for someone like him, it's it was you know a complete failure. You know, people weren't lining the streets the same way they were to see Catherine and Henry. Um, there, there were big gaps in the crowds and it was a bit of a bit of a flop. We will do another episode at some point about coronations, specifically Anne Boleyn's, because it's a lot of fun to talk about. But for now, we do want to focus on the space, the uh, the stage that the coronation happened on, because we just thought that it would be nice for you to envision the world, but also the differences between the public and private spaces and the secular and religious spaces. But the coronation kind of shows that really well, that juxtaposition between public and private, because as Callie was saying, the procession to Westminster Abbey was also a really big part. We're going to be focusing more on the cathedral itself and what happened inside of it, but getting the queen to the cathedral in itself became a big to-do, and it was much more um, political and secular than the actual ritual inside the church. But uh, this is where the people could see their queen. So for Anne Boleyn, for instance, it was a chance for her to show everyone that she was now the queen and to get some good uh, public opinion, get some good PR. But yeah, like Kelly said, uh, Shetley was not convinced. I'm, I mean, if I'm honest, he was never going to be the one shouting from the rooftops, hey, this works, hey, I'm really happy about this. So I think maybe we should take him with a pinch of salt uh, to, to a certain extent, but he, he just, his cattiness tickles me. It's really fun to read the different um, versions of Anne's coronation procession, because on the one hand, you have all of the accounts that um, the crown, well, Henry and Henry's advisors, you have all the literature that they commissioned recounting the event, how, you know, it was great. And, you know, the sun came out and angels sang and the queen looked radiant and blah, blah, blah. And then you have Shapui being like, oh, people laughed at her and they threw stuff at her and they just booed her. Um, so we don't really know how well it went. We know what happened. We just don't know the public reaction. <laughs> it was a big part of it. Uh, the public, I think, to some extent, recognized their role in this, um, that their, their opinion mattered. And all of this pageantry was being put on so that they would be impressed. It was a very rare chance for the queen to have that almost one-on-one -on -one contact with the people. And I think as well with coronations and things like that there's a bit of a, a strange flip that happens with the roles that the monarchs play and the roles that the public play 
because it's almost as if they're being performed for the for the people um and I suppose in a sense it's that performative aspect of court that we touched on last week when we were talking about Hampton Court you have to play the role of the monarch and you have to do it well and you have to present yourself in a certain way but then questioning okay well how's that going to work when we're surrounded by ordinary people and then all of that is flipped almost 180 when you actually get to the church because once you get to the church the public don't matter anymore it's just about you the queen or whoever's being crowned and god because i think in all of the spectacle of the coronation procession we forget that the coronation itself is actually an extremely holy moment for the person being crowned it is the moment when they become divine in a sense um they're anointed with holy oils and they are said to be in direct contact with god so it actually is a very solemn important thing that i think can be somewhat overshadowed by the completely different performance that's going on outside with you know the free flowing wine and the pageantry and all the the excess of jewels and very very different sides to the same ceremony i think it's a weird thing for us to try and wrap our head around and even now when faced with the prospect of thinking about a coronation and things like that it's it's something very unique and it's very they 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 don't happen very often if we think of a sort of um 20th century point something a little bit more familiar just to drive this this concept home the anointing in the coronation so the holiest moment of the whole ceremony which we said is still seen as the most important moment and this is reflected in uh, queen elizabeth ii's coronation in 1953 for anybody who has studied it or uh, i don't know has watched the crown it wasn't televised the whole coronation was televised except for that moment they they panned up to show the the space they showed i think the uh, the roof of Westminster Abbey, just because it was not a moment for us to see. Whereas all the celebrations outside, that's public, you know, that's fine. But this is not a moment for the public. This is a moment for the Queen and for God. And that's it. And I think that's where we potentially have to maybe pause for a moment and talk about the ritualistic aspects of these ceremonies and what's really going on there because it is a transformative thing with the as you said that the anointing looking a bit deeper at it and thinking what's you know what's the meaning of it and what the significance of it because this was a really big deal you know crossing that divide um and becoming a queen you know as, as you mentioned at the start only two out of the six of our queens got it it's not a given that just because you're a queen, you get a coronation. And it, it, it does a lot to kind of set people apart. And when, you know, especially when you're thinking later on about politics or, you know, the roles that they were to then take on after Henry died. So with that, should I maybe fill in some of the blanks and talk about the actual ceremony? Uh, because yes. Because... If you listen to the first episode of our podcast, you will know that I wrote an essay about this for my MA. So I have come well prepared with background knowledge for you listeners. Once the Queen got to Westminster Abbey, she enters the cathedral and the coronation ceremony is underway. Interestingly, the coronation ceremonies are pretty much spelled out step by step in this medieval manuscript called Liber Regalis, uh, the royal book. It uh, has more than just, you know, the man, it's more than just the manual for coronation ceremonies. There's a lot of stuff in there, but it does list out the order of ceremony for coronations and of various kinds too. Like there's um, the king's coronation, but also there's different ones for whether a queen is being crowned with her husband or alone. So both coronations, Catherine and Anne's followed this order. Uh, for anyone interested, you can actually go see the manuscript at the new museum at Westminster Abbey. Um, it is it is quite something, but I digress. The ceremony for a queen alone, which I'm going to focus on just because it shows us a little bit more of what it took to become a queen, 
Um, so Anne Boleyn's ceremony, she was anointed with holy oils, as we said, and that is her becoming the divine presence on earth. So she's God's chosen, not only Henry's, but God's. She also takes on some political significance as well. She is given the scepter and orb, which represent her um, her ruling over the state. And interestingly enough, um, Anne Boleyn was actually crowned, like the physical crown that was put on her head was the monarch's crown. It was the crown of Edward the Confessor. So she's seen as taking on this political role. But because the whole ceremony happens in Westminster Abbey, because it happens in a church, it is classified more as a religious ceremony. The uh, the anointing really is the the big the big thing there. I like the idea that there's a big book of coronations, effectively, and a big book of rules of this must be done at this point, or this step cannot be missed, otherwise this goes wrong and you've not done it properly. Yeah, I think down to what people are wearing and like what door you should enter. It's uh, if I think the text is actually available online translated from the Latin. So if, if you're any of you are curious, you should definitely go read it because it's uh, I had a blast going through it. It's sort of funny in retrospect. Oh, really? Yeah, just seeing all of the um, the faff, as you would all say. <laughs> what what is life without faff and pomp and pageantry when you know a coronation is concerned otherwise known as the title of our alternative podcast faff and pageantry <laughs> so thinking back to the actual space itself i'll ask you the question what do you think westminster abbey itself even today when you go visit westminster abbey what do you think it says about the ritual the coronation ritual as a whole like what what hits you about that space i think for me the the, the most immediate thing i think of was with, with with westminster abbey is how big it is and how imposing it is on the landscape it's for those of you who haven't been it, it's a very imposing beautiful space both inside and out you know when you're inside it's full of this religious iconography um, every every which way you turn and it's it's stunning and I think the other thing we need to remember about Westminster Abbey is that that is where kings and queens of England have had their coronation since the time of William the Conqueror so it's got this long long tradition and a lot of gravity that comes with the with you know stepping through those doors to your coronation and then coming back out with them once that act has taken place. And when we're looking at Anne's coronation, which was very focused on um, validity and showing that Anne was just as much a queen as her predecessor had been, I think it was really, really important for them to have it at Westminster Abbey. Not that there was any question that they were going to, but the space itself held so much significance, as you were saying, as the place where everyone since the conqueror had been crowned, you know, damned if Anne wasn't going to have that same experience in order to be seen as a worthy successor in a way to Catherine of Aragon, she had to go through the same ceremony and the the abbey itself, the church is very much a part of that, I think. So I think for Anne to have it any bit anywhere else would have just been to completely undermine her, her legitimacy as Henry's queen and as, and as his wife. So like you were saying, that there was no other choice there. Um, it, it had to be there. It couldn't be anywhere else. I think even even if you go there, you know, just, just for a visit, you know, if you ever get the chance or have some pictures or do any of those virtual tours, you know, just standing in that nave and when you're actually in the space itself, I you can't help but feel the weight of it, its impressiveness and its significance. It's in a very calming sort of way, I think, and in a very surreal way. But yeah, I, that that's not something that would have been, it's not lost, you know, when you go on a visit, let alone when you're going there to be, be crowned a queen. Yeah, I first went to Westminster Abbey when I was uh, 15 or 16 years old. And I mean, I walked in biased because I knew a lot of the history of the space already, but you can still feel that weight. Like, even as you said, when you're not going there to you know, commune with God and become this anointed, deified person. When you're just visiting, 
it still has that incredible weight. And even for somebody like me, who's not religious and not even English, you, you feel the immense amount of history in that building. So it's like it's absorbed all of the stuff that has happened over the years, whether it's all of the coronations or all of the funerals or weddings, just it is a holy space, yes, but it is a historical space. So holy in its own way for us us, us history geeks. I think that's a really nice way to put it. It's, it's holy for different people in different ways. So now I think is a really good opportunity to kind of switch gears a little bit um, and move over to the other side of what we're discussing this week. So Kate, do you want to tell everyone what we talked about this time? In this half, we will be really switching gears because instead of talking about the happy ceremonial moment when a queen is made, we're going to be talking about when a queen is unmade, specifically for two of our queens when they were executed at the Tower of London. Like you said, we, we are switching gears big time. And the tone of this is slightly different because you know we are dealing with the end of people's lives and things like that, I have to say. But when we were planning this episode and talking about it, this is the side I was most excited about. Just because the Tower of London has such a massive reputation and it represents so much. So I think it's worth if we dig into that a little bit. Um, and just uh, spend a minute talking about the Tower itself. The Tower of London um, is now a fortress that sits right on the banks of the River Thames in London. And its original tower, the White Tower, which sits right at the very heart of it, that was built as a direct response to the Norman Conquest um, and was finished being built in around 1100. It's a bit of contention about that, so it's kind of like 1190, uh, 1090 or you know, 1100, some, somewhere thereabouts. Now, the significance of the Tower of London, I think, is really represented in the way that it changed the physical landscape of London. I don't know if you'd agree with me, um, but it was there, as, a, as I mentioned, a direct response to the Norman Conquest. And it was there to act, one, as a physical deterrent for anyone thinking now's a good time to rise up against a new king, so William the Conqueror, anyone thinking it was a good chance to rebel. But it also acts as a point of defence. Um, especially after it was being built out and be built into the fortress that it is now. Um, and what's really exciting about the place itself is that, um, as I mentioned, it's got so many moving parts to it. So in its lifetime, it's been a place where uh, coins have been made. So it's been a mint. It's been an archive. It's been a royal palace. It has been a prison. A menagerie. Um, a menagerie thing. I forgot. That's my favourite part as well. And I the forgot zoo. about the zoo. I love yeah. the zoo. <laughs> um, but I think the things that really stick in people's mind about the Tower of London is um, it's used as a prison and it was actually being used as a prison um, well into the 20th century. But also it's a place that um, is synonymous with murder and execution and torture. And I think that's the bit we really want to focus on. That's not something that's just sprung up out of nowhere. That's not a reputation that it's just earned itself from myth and legend. The Tower of London has always been had a very dark and notorious reputation. One point I do want to make before we go on, and it's sort of a good segue between part one and part two of this episode, is that yes, the tower has a reputation for being very dark. And it was a prison. It's, you know, as a landmark today, it is most associated with all of the Tudor monarchs who had the reputation of throwing people that they disliked into the tower to rot or die. But it also held significance because it was the official sort of royal residence in the city of London. If you occupied the Tower of London, you had control of the city, which was the most important city in your kingdom. Because of this, it became a tradition for the monarch to spend the night in the Tower of London before the coronation ceremonies. So in our case, Anne Boleyn spent the night in the Tower the night before her coronation in a moment that must have been very triumphant for her because here she is, a new queen entering the main seat of 
this huge part of her kingdom. But then you flip the coin, it takes on an entirely new, darker connotation because it's also the last place that she was alive on Earth. And I, I definitely don't think that that would have been something that would have been lost on her. As, as you mentioned, I think that the tower represented a lot of different things for a lot of different people. Um, and, you know, depending on who, who you're asking on what given day, it's, it's invariably going to change. Um, so I, I think that, you know, that is very significant. And I think Anne would have been acutely aware of that. What I do think is interesting as well is that her route in and out of the tower, or in both times especially, would have been the same. She's coming in off the waterway, off the Tower of London, what is effectively now known as Traitor's Gate, um, and that's where it's got its reputation from. But it was also a place in which, you know, uh, people uh, guests into the Royal Palace and um, just because the entrance is the same and the person is the same does not mean someone's visits go to be the same. It's the scene of, for Anne, the highest highs and the lowest lows. And also worth noting is not just the place and, you know, coming through the same way, but Anne's execution, which took place on May 19th, 1536, happened almost, not quite, but almost a couple weeks shy of the third anniversary of her coronation. So it was the same time of year. Everything probably looked the same. She was probably having a lot of memories of this really triumphant time in her life. But now she's fearing for her life. Or in some cases, she doesn't even know what's going on. Because when she first came to the tower after she was arrested, she had no idea what was going on. So it was this really fretful time spent in the exact same place that had been made over for her years before. You know, Henry VIII uh, redid the Queen's apartments at the tower to, you know, be really sumptuous for her coronation. And now here she is, a prisoner about to die in that same space. It's, geez, it's, it's two extreme sides of the same spectrum. It, there's a lot. I think if people, you know, were only capable of processing so much. So to be in that same place for so for two very different reasons, I, I can't even, you know, how, how do you even start comprehending that? How do you prepare yourself for, you know, a quote unquote good death? If you're, you know, as you mentioned, you're not sure why you're there or what the hell is going on? And as you said in the introduction, the tower already had this reputation as being a place where people may not come out ever again. But I think Anne Boleyn's execution was the first time that it was proved to the public the lengths that Henry VIII in particular, but other monarchs after him, the lengths they would go to to have their power secured. Anne was technically, she was, she was the Queen of England. And so I think there was some belief that for a while Henry was just trying to scare her. But then when she never came back out of the tower and she was ultimately executed there, the tower took on a new sense of nobody is safe once they've come here. And jumping the gun <laughs> quite a few years, Anne Boleyn's daughter, the Lady Elizabeth, the future Queen Elizabeth I, she was arrested and imprisoned in the tower by her older sister, the then Queen Mary I. And I mean, this isn't recorded anywhere, uh, so we can't know her exact thoughts on this. But I, I can't help but think that when she went through that same gate and she entered the tower and she saw the rooms that had been made over for her mother's coronation and then the site of her mother's execution a few yards away, she would have had that same sense of foreboding of this could be my fate too. So it, it, the, just as we were saying, Westminster Abbey carries history and triumph. The tower carries that doom. You know, I, I feel like at this point we should be queuing the, the thunder sounds and, and the, the rain because that to me, you know, it is very... Um, the raven is calling. Yeah, well, it is. It's caught up in, in, in the ravens being there, isn't it? So some people might think it odd for us to pair these two together because... We just talked about coronations and rituals and this grand historic space, Westminster Abbey. And now we're talking about the place where it all literally went to die. So, you know, you might you might be wondering where we're going with this. But we talked about this and we thought that this would be a good mashup because the art of dying 
for these two queens was also an important ceremony, not by the book as with a coronation. You know, it wasn't as planned out. It wasn't as regulated. But there was some element of ritual to it, especially after Anne Boleyn's execution. She kind of set the precedent for things in a lot of ways. So we wanted to go through that just to show you how much the space impacts that ritual just as it does the coronation. I mean, very, two very different types of ritual, but just bear with us. <laughs> we do have a point. With with these two, um, you know, we, we mentioned with Westminster Abbey, only two queens got a, a coronation. Only two queens were executed. So there are two very symbolic rituals that are taking place in two of these queens' lives, and both carry very different weight and very different meaning. Uh, so, some more background for you, just so we're all on the same page. Anne Boleyn, as I think I said before, was executed on May 19th, 1536, and she was arrested on charges of treason, adultery, incest, predicting the king's death. There was a whole slew of charges that uh, we're pretty sure now most historians are that they were not true, but she did commit the ultimate crime of not providing a male heir, and she was irritating, I guess. So Henry wanted to get rid of her, and this is the extreme that he and, yes, Thomas Cromwell went to. So she was uh, arrested, and she was sent to the tower, and then she had a lengthy wait. I think she entered the tower on May Day, right? May Day, 1536, and she had to wait almost 20 days for... Yeah. Her execution because she also had to go through a trial but she was also um, executed alongside five men including her brother who were her supposed lovers we'll get into that in a in a minute uh the other execution we are talking about is Catherine howard's which occurred on february 13th 1542 similar charges she was charged with treason and adultery for allegedly carrying on an affair, but also coming to the marriage with Henry uh, not being a virgin. Still not sure what's going on there, if, if that's true or not. She both admitted to her crime and then declared her innocence, so we, we can't be too sure about that. But ultimately, she died a very innocent and naive 17-year-old, probably. So uh, that, hers is a very tragic I think at the end of the day, opinions aside about these women, and I, I know um, some of them are more divisive than others, and everybody's got their own opinions. They, uh, I think one of the things we forget is that they are people sometimes. And it is, it's so easy to do, you know, with the way they've been dramatized and things like that. But we, we do forget that they are people, and you can only take so much. For both women, there was a huge emphasis on dying well, which we we sort of mentioned before. And I think this is where the ritualistic aspect comes in, because a uh, contrary to, I think, some dramatic portrayals, they're not going in some kind of like defensive, angry way. Both women end up being incredibly humble and quiet and res almost resigned to their fates by the time that they reach the scaffold. Both Anne and Catherine gave speeches right before their executions that ask for everybody's forgiveness and, you know, please pray for me, please pray for the king because he's a really great guy. And I'm sure he doesn't mean this, you know, he's just doing his job as the king. And there's a lot of emphasis on what people will think of them afterwards, I guess. And uh, I think this is especially evident with Catherine Howard. Catherine, I suppose, knew in a sense what was coming because the night before her execution, she asked for, and um, this, this breaks my heart every single time I think about it, the execution block to be delivered to her room so she could practice laying her head so she could die well. Because she didn't want to be embarrassed. She wanted to die with some dignity. And for her, that involved knowing what to do and being seen to be calm and resigned. That's where the ritual comes in. But I think especially with these two women, considering what they went through and the probable um, incorrect death sentence, the fact that they went to their deaths so cleanly and so maturely says a lot about them, but also this process of the execution. They had to be mindful of the people they were leaving behind. So that idea and that um, ritual... It, 
dying a good death wasn't only just for themselves, but, you know, we've got to think about their families that they were leaving behind, especially Anne with Elizabeth. I think that's a good place to introduce this uh, concept of public versus private executions then, because the thing that distinguishes these two queens' executions are that they took space within the walls of the tower. And that's an important distinction to make because that is a really big status symbol. Most people who were arrested and imprisoned in the tower didn't actually die inside the walls on Tower Green, which is the yard inside the tower. They were taken to a site of public execution out right outside uh, on Tower Hill, which is, you know, you can see it from the tower. It's right outside. But the difference being that members of the general public, so Londoners, could come to your execution and watch you being killed if you were executed on Tower Hill. And executions in 16th century England were a spectator sport. This was something that you would plan your day around because it was really exciting to go see an execution. There were several sites all over London where you could go and see people executed in all different kinds of ways. But Tower Hill was really exciting because it did tend to be the political prisoners coming out of the tower. So for example, the five men who were executed alongside Anne Boleyn were actually executed a couple of days before her, and they were executed on Tower Hill as opposed to inside the walls. So there's a very important distinction to make between Anne Boleyn and Catherine Howard dying within the walls of the tower and having the time and sort of respectful air to give their last speech and die in some kind of privacy where only a few people are watching as opposed to being on Tower Hill where you're being like jeered by the public and everybody can witness the humiliation of it. I think one thing we need to remember is that they were all members of the court. They were courtiers in one way or another. Um, So these are men of relative status. And especially when we think about her brother, George, who was a vice, the vice count of Rochford and, you know, brother to the queen, all of that just cast aside his title and his rank mean nothing in the face of his the, the, the crimes he committed alongside the other men. Though they carried less state, I, I, yeah, less status and less kind of heft with their titles and things like that, they were still notable people at court. I think there's a really nice clean parallel between this public space involving the public in this political display and versus the privacy and solemnity of a death inside the tower walls in much the same way that the first half of the coronation the procession to Westminster Abbey is this moment of almost vulnerability because you don't know how the crowd's going to react to you and it could be very humiliating like if if you saw Shepley's account of Anne Boleyn's coronation procession is true and people were laughing at her that'd be pretty humiliating. But once you get into the cathedral, they don't matter because it's all been very well planned out and it's all about you and you have this chance to commune very peacefully and respectfully with God. It's sort of the same thing with with an execution. You know, if if you're out there being executed with the public, nobody is going to necessarily mourn you in the same way that they might inside the tower because they're more more respectful of your status and the occasion of your death. You're you're a queen of England being executed. And I think everybody was a little bit more respectful, even if the people who are watching you die are the people who got you up there in the first place. Like, like we mentioned earlier, while they don't necessarily fit together on the face of things, there's a lot more that these rituals share in common than we perhaps otherwise think of. And I think as well, it's probably worth linking it back to a discussion that we actually had last week um, surrounding court and the idea of the public and the private first at court. Again, if Chapuy can be believed, Catherine Howard actually specifically asked as her one request, as her one concession in all of this, to be executed privately. She, according to Chapuy, she asked for no favor except that the execution shall be secret and not under the eyes of the world. To exercise that one piece of control over how your life ends is really important. I think very brave of her, I think, as well, to ask for that to be her concession, you know, and not anything, you know, that might be deemed as frivolous. 
But on Tower Green today, there is a memorial for the all of these people who died within the tower walls in the vicinity of that point. And the names on it, I think, are really evocative of our point because they're all high nobility. There are three queens, Anne Boleyn, Catherine Howard, and then Lady Jane Grey, who was queen for nine days. Your status gets you a good death. So when we think about the tower today, it's sort of sad to think that the deaths of these two women are what the space is most associated with from for a lot of people and how profitable it's been for tourism at the tower everyone to some extent i think enjoys hearing the bloody stories of executions on tower green and it's just sad because i think we lose a lot of that nuance when we go to the tower just because we associate it with the the disturbing blood and gore kind of stories Thank you so much for listening to this episode of our podcast. In the next episode, Callie and I will be discussing the spaces that the queens lived in without Henry. In the meantime, you can find the full transcript of this episode plus the resources we used to prepare for our conversation on our website. You can now also check us out on Twitter and Instagram and Facebook. So make sure you head over to our YouTube to like and subscribe and find those pages. Long live the queens!